Hi there. Uh, my name is Dean. I work at Warner Brothers. Um, I've been at Warner Brothers or Time Warner for 25 years, so I'm sort of a relic and a fossil. Uh, but um, I work in copyright uh, in the corporate legal department and deal a lot with um, our distribution aspects of our businesses, uh, content protection, and then copyright policy, both in the domestic and international fronts. And I'm delighted to be here. And this is my alma mater, but I won't tell you what year because <laughs> it'll even make me feel worse. Hi, I'm, I'm Stephen Frank. I'm a partner at Silly Austin. I work uh, in Palo Alto and San Francisco. Um, I do technology deals for the past 10 years, I'd say almost exclusively digital entertainment deals, um, film, television, uh, music, periodicals, books, et cetera. Um, and uh, I'd say in the past two years, with the, uh, with the emergence of new entrants in the digital distribution market, I've been doing a lot of work on in interesting co-production deals between um, what have been historically been distributors and content creators, and now they're sort of doing deals together to generate uh, content for new platforms. Um, a lot of my work is for Amazon uh, on, their, on their video service and related digital services. Um, I also do a fair amount of work for Hulu and Microsoft on the Xbox platform. I'm Marisa Brudico. I'm at YouTube and Google. I uh, started at Wilson Sonsini doing technology transactions, and then I went to Apple as corporate counsel for iTunes. And I've been at YouTube and Google now for about four years. I focus on um, doing a lot of our premium content and technology deals and advising as those platforms develop. I do a lot of work on our emerging verticals. So when I started, that was our entertainment business, and it's become now working a lot more on our live streaming platform, sports, government, news, education work, and gaming. Um, and I'm very happy to be here, too. I'm a double Stanford alum, so I love coming back to the farm. I, I'm Ken Kaufman. I'm a partner at Manat Phelps & Phillips in Washington, DC. I do a lot of work in digital media, technology, entertainment law, and copyright. And I represent a lot of clients, both on the copyright owner side and on the technology digital media side, which is maybe a little bit unusual. Um, I used to be in-house at a uh, few companies, Showtime Networks in New York, Polygram Records in New York, and the Kennedy Center in Washington. And I've represented uh, a number of clients here in Silicon Valley, including uh, Apple in 2003 when they launched the iTunes Music Store. I helped them with their license agreements with record companies, publishers, rights societies, and, and a variety of others. And uh, it's, it's good to be, to be out here. Uh, we were going to be joined as well by Sidney Toon, who was unable to make it last minute. Uh, so the four of us will sort of carry, carry the ball. Um, we're going to start off by talking about the evolving relationship between content owners and distributors and sort of the dance they've been engaged in over the last several years that's evolved in very significant ways, starting out with, with maybe a more acrimonious relationship and, and evolving into an increasingly cooperative one. Uh, there was a lot of discussion on that toward the end of the last panel, so it's probably a good segue into what we're going to be talking about. And it's our perspective that over time, content owners and distributors have realized that by trying to resolve the contentious legal issues that had arisen and working together, it's sort of a win-win situation uh, for all of them, and that even while the Viacom litigation and other lawsuits were pending, many content owners were looking for ways to monetize their content on YouTube and other platforms. Uh, so I initially wanted to ask uh, Dean from the content owner perspective and Marisa from the distributor perspective to, to give their views on how this evolution has played out, what new business models and best practices have, have developed. Thanks, Ken. I mean, fr from our perspective, it's, it's a very exciting time with all of these new um, emerging platforms coming, coming to market. Um, being working for a studio where it's audiovisual content really for many years when the internet was first emerging our files were really too big and just too much data to have 
really good, reliable delivery of quality video to the home over the net. That's obviously now changed with um, advances in broadband, broadband technology and compressions technology. And so whether it's over-the-top delivery or subscription video on demand or video on demand or pay-per-view services, you know, that's, that's a, all opens up very exciting <laughs> avenues and opportunities for us to pursue to get our content to consumers, including cloud services. Like we've, we've been using ultraviolet. We worked to help develop that ultraviolet cloud service to enable consumers when they purchase our content to, to enjoy it on multiple devices and be able to share it among a, 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 a limited degree of family and friends. Where we run into challenges with technology is if people who are innovating technology, no surprise, I have a very different view from Fred about the Aereo case. If you were at the, at the la last panel, you know, innovate technology and then use the fact that the technology is new as, you know, some sort of justification to usurp business models and take copyrighted content without any sort of form of authorization or payment and exploit it for commercial means. And so that's where I think the point of friction is um, in terms of things like YouTube and user-generated content. I feel at, at our studio, we've, we've always kind of had a, a very liberal take on that, seeing that that is really fan engagement with our content, not stuff that really commercially competes with the content, with the whole content that we're trying to get out um, and deliver to consumers on, on a commercial basis. So I think part of what this evolving dance involves, at least from a content owner perspective and speaking just from the Warner Brothers perspective, is looking at the unauthorized uses and saying, okay, is that something that really is competing and eroding our fundamental content creation and distribution business, or is it something that's potentially, even though unauthorized, possibly ancillary if it's monetized through YouTube's content ID system, or just a, 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 a show of fan engagement? And in fact, I mean, we can, we can speak later, but, but we've even looked out on the landscape. We saw somebody who on YouTube was doing these short episodes based on one of our video games called Mortal Kombat. And these were incredibly popular webisodes. So we just ended up hiring this guy at Warner Brothers, you know, and in the games division to produce these webisodes officially and um, to work towards even monetizing them more. So I think flexibility is really a, 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 a touchstone uh, in this world. So, yes, it's been great working with. Um, uh, Dean and the team over at Warner Brothers. That's one of the deals we recently uh, redid, and they have, we've really evolved, I think, in this space. Um, for me, it's especially exciting because when I was at Wilson's and Senior, I represented a lot of startups that were doing, had UGC platforms. Um, small startups like Yard Barker that ended up getting acquired by Fox Sports and was on the other side of things trying to advise a startup on how to deal with UGC issues and getting cease and desist from the pro leagues and everything like that. And now I, um, get to be at a place at YouTube that really works with these kinds of content creators and but also I focus on doing the deals with our premium content providers like the professional sports leagues in order to try and help them engage with their fans and decide to leave the content up. So um, what I also enjoy seeing is that the not all studios are exactly where Warner Brothers is in terms of their um, uh, their strong usage of content ID and monetizing as opposed to blocking. Um, but we are seeing that shift over time. And the, the sports leagues that I work a lot with now are kind of where the studios were many years ago in terms of just tipping their toe into the water. Some, like the NBA, have been on our platform for five years. They're one of our top partners. They use content ID. They create playlists. Um, they are. Um, the number one sports partner on YouTube, and their subscribers love how the NBA uses Content ID. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there are other leagues that you will see less content on YouTube because they choose to block. Um, Fred said things about Content ID. He said it so well, and Fred is such an expert in this area, so I'm not going to duplicate what he says. But the, the one other area, just 
to be clear, is that we have the options of block, track, or monetize. And so track is also a good option for a lot of our partners because they don't, need, they don't care about making money, but they want to see about it for promotional and marketing purposes and the virality of the use. So um, that's also something uh, that a lot of our partners take advantage of for different reasons. Um, as, as a related point, of their content, and I'm just curious as to your perspectives on what um, trends and best practices have evolved in that area. Well, I'll speak to that a little bit, which, and I'll say something that is probably somewhat surprising to, to many folks in this audience. When YouTube and Google were first rolling out the content ID system, it actually didn't have the options of um, block, track, or monetize. It was really a filtering and blocking technology to begin with. And um, they came to us and said, look, we've got this new technology. You just submit your files, you know, digital files of your content that you're concerned about being uploaded without authorization on YouTube. We will fingerprint it. We will do matching as users seek to upload their content. And if there's a match, will block it and that content won't be uploaded. And so we asked, you know, well, okay, what are what's the time length for for the match and is it a simultaneous video and audio match or is it just one or the other and it was basically I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was something like a 30 second or 45 second match would cause the block. And so what we said to, to Google and YouTube is, look, we really appreciate that you've developed this technology and we'd like to work with you on future iterations of it, but we are not going to use it at this time because we feel that that will overblock and that there will be too many mashups if you're just blocking 30 seconds, particularly if it's the video fingerprint only of the content, that we, if we were to see it up there, would let it be, continue to be posted and we would not send a notice to take it down. So actually we didn't use it and we waited and we actually worked cooperate. I mean, we didn't work technically, but we, we said, look, we'd love to be able to set parameters based on time, based on continuity, you know, so it could be a five minute clip from a movie, right? But if it's 30 seconds from all different parts of the movie, that's different than if it's five or 10 minutes of a complete, not non-interrupted linear sequence of a movie, for example. So we wanted to look at sequential elements, timing elements, and then whether it was video or audio or both. And so actually to Google and YouTube's credit, they, de they developed that. So now we can use those parameters to feel more comfortable that we're not blocking the types of creative fan engagements of our content that we would otherwise you know, be happy to see posted. I think, and just with regards to that, um, Warner Brothers is, is very savvy, and obviously there are smaller players in this space who may not have the resources to, I mean, the parameters really help them because they don't have the resources to manually go through and look at a lot of things, but there are also some partners that do have great resources. Um, ML, Major League Soccer is an example, for example, that they, do manually go through and they don't just rely on parameters because they are actually sifting through and deciding how they want to create play playlists or how or what f what things they want uh, to become more popular or feature or things like that. Um, we've seen that that high level of engagement really um, really helps with their monetization and their number of subscribers and the virality of it. Um, and also some partners actually outsource uh, those services um, because they in-house don't have that expertise or those resources. So there's different uh, partners take advantage of the, the mashups and the playlists and everything um, on different varying levels. Uh, the emergence of, of new digital media and platforms uh, to distribute content, among other things, has resulted in massive disruptions to traditional business models in the entertainment industry. Uh, these include, among others, the increased uh, importance of user-generated content as opposed to professionally produced content as popularized particularly by YouTube and other platforms. Uh, second, a, a desire by users to be able to access content on demand as opposed to pre-programmed uh, linear scheduling. Um, 
Third, uh, the emergence of short form video as opposed to say 30 or 60 minute uh, television episodes. Uh, fourth, uh, new models for downloading, streaming of various kinds of content. Uh, changing of, of what's called windowing in the movie and TV industry, sequential uh, distribution outlets uh, for exhibition of video programming. Uh, the emergence of online distributors uh, such as Netflix and Amazon in addition to, to YouTube. We've also seen a host of new acronyms, VOD, SVOD for subscription video on demand, OTT for over the top, and so on. Uh, Stephen, initially I'd just like to ask you what your views are regarding the disruption that has occurred, and I would then invite uh, Marisa and Dean to chime in as well. Sure. Um, I, think of, I think of it both as disruption and um, amazing opportunities as well. I mean, for a long time, we've heard folks say for, you know, naysayers or, you know, enthusiasts, whatever you want to call them, you know, the internet is going to tel kill television or it's going to kill the film industry. Um, and I think, frankly, what's happened is that a lot, the availability of all these over-the-top services um, on broadband-enabled television, set-top boxes, Blu-ray players, you know, your computer, et cetera, have, you know, have created great opportunities and actually interesting, uh, strange bedfellows as a result. I mean, this past week it was announced by Variety that Amazon had just picked up a pilot called Point of Honor from, from ABC Studios, from the writer of Lost. Um, you know, Chris Carter's new show from the X-Files, Chris Carter's new show was on Amazon Instant Video. Um, it's called <coughs> The After. Another new show that's about to launch on Amazon is Jill Soloway's new show, She Created Six Feet Under and the United States of Terror called Transparent. These are sort of interesting opportunities where it's not the Netflixes and the Amazons and the Microsofts and the Hulus of the world going out there and just dusting off, you know, content that's been on the shelf for years that no studio or no network has wanted to pick up because it may not be of, of sufficient value or quality for the networks or the studio's perspective. These are new opportunities that cre create opportunities not only for the studios that want to produce this stuff and monetize this stuff and the, and the, and the creatives who actually have amazing talent in terms of writing and show running and production and otherwise, um, and distributors like Amazon and Hulu and Netflix that really want to distinguish their services from services of their competitors. Um, you know, and, and as a result, you know, great revenue opportunities have been created. You know, if you think about the launch of, of SVOD services, subscription video on demand, Netflix being the most, you know, well-known one, Amazon Instant Video being another, you know, all of a sudden now, content owners have found, you know, opportunities for deep library content that they might not have been able to monetize for years and years and years because of, frankly, the availability and all the touch points on the eco ecosystem of the internet that will make that, that, that content available to consumers. Um, you look at an, a, a, a deal like the one between DreamWorks and Netflix. DreamWorks decided that they want to no longer do their HBO deal, um, and they chose as their partner Netflix to basically do a, an output deal for over 300 hours of original television programming that will be shown exclusively on Netflix. And it's going to be based upon DreamWorks' film franchises, which are great sort of stepping stones for successful television shows. So, you know, I think that the, the, the relationships have shifted, the paradigms have shifted, the windowing has shifted as a result of content that historically might have been shown on television first and then shown on the internet is now actually being shown on over-the-top internet services first, typically on an SVOD basis, and then works its way onto what we think of as traditional television, both inside the U.S. and out. Um, so I think that it's been both disruptive and a great opportunity on both sides of the equation. And the dance has become an interesting one. We talk about dance at the beginning because all of a sudden, content owners and distributors who were very much sitting on the opposite side of the tables and all of their distribution deals for a decade now are thinking co cooperatively about how do we actually create and monetize this content in a way that achieves the goals of the content owner and achieves the goals of, uh, goals of the distributor, and quite often, and we'll get to this later, they're both the owners of that content, and that creates interesting opportunities and challenges as well. Yeah, I, I very much agree with, with Steve. Um, one, one of the benefits of being a fossil is that um, I, I, I recall when HBO started, HBO was purely a subscription cable service to deliver movies that studios have produced. HBO made none of its own original content. Now, I would venture to say that probably the majority of people who subscribe to HBO subscribe for original HBO content, Game of Thrones, Sopranos, you all, you all are familiar with it, um, you know, uh, 
What's the new one on Silicon Valley? I can't remember the title Silicon of it. Valley. Silicon, Silicon Valley. Valley. <laughs> 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 um, and, and so I think that's absolutely right, that a lot of these services that start launching as purely distribution plays in order to distinguish themselves get into the content creation business as they start investing millions of dollars in creating their content. They then share the concern that that content be monetized and, and distributed in, in authorized fashions as opposed to um, unauthorized fashions. So I think, I think Steve is absolutely right on the synergy point. In terms of how you manage these various distribution opportunities, it is, it is really challenging, um, particularly for you know, a, a studio or, or, or a producer. Warner Brothers is both a film producer but also a huge producer of television programming because the traditional business models are quite entrenched. And you can deal with your traditional distributors who pay you an awful lot of money for the content and who are very, very nervous about the notion of changing anything that used to be in the past. So, for example, even though in movie theaters, the vast majority of the revenues of a film are generated by the theaters in the first four, three or four weeks of exhibition, they, the, the movie exhibitors freak out over the notion of moving a video window up by a month or two. The video window used to be you know, six months or nine months, now it's typically four months or three months, but the notion of trying to move it up to six weeks gets them crazy. Um, we had one example of where, you know, experimenting this with this can really just be a win-win situation is with television distribution of our U.S. produced shows. So we produce shows, let's say, like Vampire Diaries that air first in the U.S. and then typically air anywhere between 30 and 100 days, 180 days later in foreign broadcasts as we, as we license the, the programming to foreign broadcasters. Part of that has to do with dubbing and subtitling and censorship requirements, but, but there's an, an inevitable time, time uh, delay. So what we were seeing with Vampire Diaries in particular was once the program had been aired in the US, there was tremendous demand for it on pirate sites, you know, within 24 hours because it's broadcast, it's in the clear, anybody can videotape it, digitize it, put it, put it up on the, uh, on the net. So we went to the UK broadcaster, the UK licensee for Vampire Diaries, and I think their time delay was about 30 days. And we said, look, we would like to offer the show 24 hours after US broadcast on Apple and to develop some legitimate, to satisfy this huge demand for the show. And um, we think it will also generate more interest in the show. The broadcaster was very skeptical, but agreed that to do a test run and allow us to offer it on iTunes in the UK 24, 24 hours after US broadcast. We ended up getting great sales on iTunes, and then the broadcaster experienced increased ratings for that season versus their broadcast the prior season. So it really ended up being a win-win, but it was not easy getting the broadcaster to agree to you know, sort of loosen up and allow this, what they saw as a potentially competitive uh, channel of exploitation go before their broadcast. Um, and also, we uh, failed to mention, so many of you in the audience are very savvy and in this space as well, and I think we know many of you, so we had thought as a panel, it's okay if you want to chime in as questions with questions as we go along, um, and we'll do our best to answer them, because I think a lot of you are very familiar with this space, so we want to make sure we answer with as much specificity as of interest to you. Um, to Dean's point, I think um, the way that I view working with our partner, our premium partners on deals is that I don't look to cannibalize what they're doing already, but look to augment what they're doing. So our partners, I'll use um, the Olympics as an example. So we do our deals with the US Olympic Committee or the international, the IOC. And they look and see what rights they've already granted to broadcast networks, and then what is what is left. Like if they have a pile of sticks, what, what sticks do they have left? Which ones are, do they have, 
completely and they haven't given it all away or do they just they gave away non-exclusive rights to someone and 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 I think YouTube and Google provide them a place to to put that content in various forms in different business models than they may otherwise see so we do a lot of work with the IOC and international live streaming of Olympics in different places um, um, and the last Olympics uh, we, so we live streamed the Olympics um, Let's see, six years ago, the Summer Olympics uh, on a white label player. This time, we, we no longer do that. That was our first foray into live streaming. So now we only will use a YouTube branded player. So this time, um, NBC wanted to, to use their own player since they had the broadcast rights. But we worked with the USOC to do the shoulder content for the games, um, a lot of which was shown on NBC later because we let them have the derivative rights. So the documentaries about the athletes, they, did, they got funding from YouTube to try and um, see this space to see how does the long tail do on YouTube? What's the shoulder content look like? Um, how does live streaming of the trials, the US Olympic trials perform? We had those rights. So I think we really try and work with a partner to see what are they already doing. And then as I've seen it evolve, those partners, when they do their next broadcasting deal, keep some more of the rights from the networks or they or not just give them to them exclusively like they do before or they place a higher value on those rights than they did before and so the next time we do a deal with them then we um, have even you know we have even more types of content or business models that we can engage with them on so it's evolving and, and, fo and following up on what uh, the other panelists were saying uh, it, it strikes me that a lot of what's been happening in terms of uh, online distributors getting involved in producing original content or getting exclusive rights is not that different from, I mean, Dean, what you were talking about with HBO originally simply showing previously produced programming. When I was at Showtime, we decided the best way we could compete with HBO was by having exclusive content you could only get on Showtime. So we actually did the first exclusive output deal with the studio, which was a five-year deal with Paramount, and we produced the first TV series for pay cable networks. Uh, the first one was Fairy Tale Theater with Shelley mm -hmm. Duvall. Um, and similarly, I, I, in the mid to late 90s, I represented AOL when it was uh, a much smaller service that was competing with CompuServe and Prodigy. And it decided the best way to uh, compete in its marketplace was, was by uh, acquiring and producing original content that you could only uh, access through HBO. And, I just wanted to mention also that in some ways, uh, obviously, the music industry was disrupted even earlier than the motion picture and TV industries. When Napster hit in 1999, I think the record companies were totally unprepared for that. They ended up coming up with a couple of services, MusicNet and PressPlay, that were sort of half-hearted. And it wasn't until um, Apple launched the iTunes Music Store in 2003 that there was a, quote, legitimate service that could compete in some fashion and, and won a lot of uh, customer acceptance with uh, free uh, 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 distribution by offering um, uh, added value, uh, a wide variety of uh, uh, a, a large selection and a reasonable price point. And the music industry, obviously, over the last 10 years or so, has been experimenting with different models. It seems things are migrating more toward an on-demand model uh, services like uh, Spotify. Um, and with AOL having just purchased uh, Beats Music, uh, probably getting into that area as well. So just following up on what we've been talking about, and again, as Marisa said, if any of you have questions as we go along, we'd be happy to address them. Um, we, we have seen this trend where uh, historical distributors have been getting into content creation and acquisition. Um, and in addition, we've seen a, a trend of users desiring to, to be able to access content when, where, and how they want it with a, uh, a correlating uh, expansion of media in which content is developed. Uh, in particular, mobile devices and mobile rights have become very important in the television industry, the concept of TV everywhere, where distributors in current deals, uh, uh, at least in my experience with the clients we represent, a large part of the negotiation has to do with um, what, uh, what rights are available for technologies like mobile and different platforms for different territories, what sorts of 
geofiltering have to be uh, included? Uh, what about if a subscriber goes in a different territory? Do the rights extend to that? And as a related point, uh, with the expansion of media and platforms uh, has come an enhanced uh, concern on the part of content owners uh, on adopting new measures and best practices to combat piracy uh, in the form not only of the content ID systems pioneered by, by YouTube, but other sorts of digital rights management, uh, geo-filtering, digital fingerprinting, uh, things of that sort. So I would like to ask the panelists for their views on the trends and uh, best practices that have developed with the expansion of media uh, and the concerns about uh, protecting against piracy. Do you want to? No, you start. I'll, no. yeah. right, sure. I'll, start. I'll, I'll start. If you've ever, if you've ever <laughs> negotiated uh, one of these digital distribution deals, particularly on the, in, on the video side, because as a result of DRM-free you know, MP3 downloads, there's not so much concern about m music these days, but certainly video content is very highly protected. And if you've done a, a video distribution deal, you've probably had the experience of spending hundreds of hours negotiating what's called the content protection schedule. Um, and that schedule will basically impose upon the distributor a number of requirements, the first of which will be to implement some form of DRM technology. It might be Wivine, it might be PlayReady, it might be you know, you, a, a, an Adobe streaming um, DRM, but there's always sort of a, a legislated form of DRM that needs to be used in connection with streams or downloads of, of, of digital content. On top of that, they're legislated in the private sector sense, <laughs> yes. not in the statutory yes. sense. Yes, yes, in the private sector sense, of course. Um, on top of that, there are going to be obligations with respect to how you um, take advantage of output protection technologies on devices to which content may be distributed. Um, and that's both analog and digital output protection technologies that are fairly standardized, and you can get a, you know, a, a, a RAND patent license to, take to implement those technologies. Um, on top of that, you'll often see maybe a 30 or 40 page schedule that lists um, devices that are authorized um, to, to, for distribution as granular as by model number and by manufacturer. Um, you'll, you'll see um, a, number of, a number of different requirements with respect to other forms of protection that need to be implemented on, on the technology. That gets rather difficult when you on the distributor side are thinking about how do we build a service that's going to be available to everyone from every device, however they try and access us. You know, if they want to get to us through an iPad, if they want to get to us through an Android mobile device, if they want to get to us through their PC, if they want to get to us through their Roku box, you know, how do we build a, an ecosystem that's going to kind of make us available um, in the same way for all of our consumers through every touch point? Um, and, and understandably, there is concern about piracy, of course, and, and, and I think from my perspective, the distributors and the content owners are, are aligned on this issue because piracy is going to result in reduced revenues both for the distributor and the content owner. Um, but it gets to be a bit of a difficult and sometimes impossible dance when, when content owners think that basically the burden and the responsibility for making sure that the sieve has no holes in it is the responsibility of the distributor and not the, the, not the content owner. Um, and, and, you know, I'm sure Dean has had experiences negotiating this as well, um, but at some point in the relationship there has to be some kind of notion that the system is not foolproof and there has to be some kind of rational approach to how do we, as best as possible, prevent unauthorized distribution of content that's being downloaded more often is where the, the issues are, but also streaming sometimes as well. Yeah, um, I'm usually, I, I, Steve and I have never negotiated against each other, oddly enough, but um, I, I'm usually on the, the content side of that, requiring um, the different implementations of the digital rights management technology. And in fact, I've spent a significant part of my career with some of the people in this room. Um, I, I've seen who maybe in their prior in, incarnations working for other companies, um, sat around tables working out these various content uh, protection technologies that were the results of multi-industry stakeholder dialogues and development and implementation and licensing to be sure that they could be rolled out in a cost-effective way across multiple devices and multiple different, different platforms. Um, at the end of the day, you know, with content protection, um, uh, a former colleague from Fox said it the best. He said, if I can see it, I can copy it. And that's absolutely true. Because at the end of the day, 
no matter how secure your digital content delivery is. Uh, a former colleague of mine used to say, at the end of the day, humans, beings, are standalone analog receiving devices. <laughs> and it's true. You've got to convert the content into analog format for us to be able to view it and to hear it. And at that point, it can be captured by camcorders. And camcorders are, you know, of increasing sophistication and ease of use these days. And, and then you've got a copy in the clear, and it can be retransmitted. So at least from our perspective at Warner Brothers, the whole point of DRM is really as a guideline to sort of guide consumers to the to the sorts of uses that are authorized and those uses that are not authorized and create some sort of inconvenience and hassle factor to jump into the unauthorized uses. But to ever think that DRM is going to provide this seamless, bulletproof, anti-piracy, um, you know, shield is kind of ridiculous, in, 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 in my opinion. So um, I hope you haven't experienced that on the Warner side, Steve, is all I can say. No. But, but, but um, uh, anyway. I would say, um, having, uh, having negotiated a deal recently with Warner Brothers, and that um, I think one of the benefits of, of, of the, the Google YouTube model is that we have history with a lot of these partners. So actually, also YouTube has a, has a paradigm that's relatively new perhaps called, we're device agnostic, right? So we don't want to get granular. We're not going to have an exhibit that lists out which platforms we're going to be on and which we're not. Um, you know, we do have a YouTube video player. So as long as, you know, we stand behind that technology and we do, we, Google did acquire Widevine, a DRM technology, which we use. So I think the good thing is we're now in a place where we, we don't get granular. There's not this, there's not 10 exhibits listing things out. There's not these usage rights types of things. Um, uh, and and so I it, it, it helps it really helps with the negotiation deal now if you think about the content that really is valuable live content is another type of content that's very valuable and when we negotiate those deals and I did the Red Bull Stratos jump for example that turned out to be a very valuable deal that um, did I don't think we realized how the percentage of the internet it would take up during the actual um, the time of the jump but you know, the, the, the technology for live streaming for protecting that is even less evolved. And yet, you know, as Dean said, people just put the stuff out there and, and, they, and they just know that, you know, everyone's doing the best they can, but, um, but they'd rather be out there on the platform than not at all. Um, and so we haven't seen, we haven't seen great, they, they don't approach um, their deals the way that the studios did in the past. The, um, the sports leagues and the other people jumping into the live space are not trying to protect it with the same regard, but it's it's working very well for them and they're able to monetize and so I think it's working out well. Yes. Was everyone able to hear the question? Okay. Well, let, let, let me speak to that, Spencer. Um, you know, we are we used to be have Time Warner Cable as an affiliated uh, cable uh, big cable company within the Time Warner family. Um, I've been with the company long enough that I've seen it grow from Warner Communications to Time Warner to AOL Time Warner, and now so it's gone like this, and now it's gone like that, and it's been it's been very interesting. Time Warner Cable was spun off a few years ago, so even though it still has the Time Warner name, there's no affiliation at all. So now um, we're really just a pure content creation and licensing distribution company with no distribution arm. Our, 
that we own ourselves. So there's no cable interest breathing down our necks in terms of these are the sorts of business models that you should really try and um, preserve, and here are the ones that you should try and spurn. Instead, I think with the technology, the idea is exactly as you said, trying to satisfy the consumer demand with enough legitimate business models that there's no need to really go onto a pi pirate website because it's easier and more reliable to get the, the, the content in a legitimate experience. As we do that, exactly what Marissa was saying, we have to do this balance between augmentation and cannibalization. So we are big supporters of TV everywhere because the cable companies pay us a lot of money for the content and it would be better for us if people didn't cut the cord because of the amount of money that the cable companies pay us for our content. So if consumers can see a better benefit from their cable subscription because the content that they love, they can consume on their devices all the better for us. With HBO, because H we, HBO owns, you know, has a better control over its rights to its content, HBO created its own HBO Go platform. To again, is the goal of that for people to cut the cord? Absolutely not. The goal of that is so people say, oh my God, now I can get a, the, the catch up on the shows that I missed on TV, on my iPad, or on my PC, that's going to make me want to be an HBO subscriber. If I'm going to be an HB HBO subscriber, then I need to be a cable and satellite subscriber. So it really is this goal towards, I would say, uh, you know, augmentation. I think the HBO Go example is a really good one because HBO, like other content owners, um, series content owners, does not actually put its content out, current season content out on a video on demand basis the day after it's broadcast on television. They actually wait basically a year after the season ends as, as if it were basically when the DVD comes out is when you can start getting video on demand, current season episodes of HBO programming. As a result of that, and I think because consumers have been so used to, I want my, I want my content now, you know, time shifted, I want to be able to basically have a video on demand when it's convenient for me, there's been a huge, I mean, an unprecedented sharing of account credentials for DirecTV and other providers through which HBO is offered as a result of consumers wanting to watch Girls or Game of Thrones or other current season shows that they can't actually buy for $1.99 or $2.99 until a year from now. So I think, it, I think your question is a good one. I think there's going to have to be some way for HBO to figure out and, and other people who have had stuck with that kind of notion of windowing to not, to not cannibalize their subscription revenue, which is a huge revenue from the broadcasters out there. Um, but, but, but I think that, I think that you know, until, until that absolute convergence of give the consumers what they want in a way that's going to basically not make them pirate and protect our existing business models align, it's going to be, for, it's going to be a difficult nut to, nut to crack. And I think that HBO thinks that the value for them is the, is the large checks they're writing as a result of their, you know, their, their subscriber fees from the, from the, from the broadcasters that actually carry their service. And I think it's, I, I, I don't ever see it, frankly, I mean, I hope not, because hopefully this will be, you know, my full employment guarantee at Warner Brothers until I'm ready to retire. But I don't, I don't actually ever see an endpoint there, because I think as technology develops, there will inevitably be new business models that emerge that we haven't even thought of, and content owners and creators and distributors are going to have to adapt. So I think it's going to be an evolving process kind of forever, frankly. And it, it reminds me again with the benefit of having my own long tail. Um, uh, you know, I distinctly remember, and it wasn't that many years ago, in sitting in content protection, anti-piracy discussions with um, people from other industries where, you know, the, 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 where a comment was made, Gee, if I go out and buy a BMW, I don't get a second one for free. Why do you think that when you buy a Blu-ray or a DVD, you should get a second copy for free? And that, you know, that wasn't, I mean, it seems like a quaint and naive and silly question now. But honestly, five or 10 years ago, well, maybe not five years ago, but 10 years ago, it wasn't. I mean, there was a very much of a debate around that point. I, I'd like to think 
that content companies have really evolved from there. So, you know, Warner Brothers was a big, big proponent of ultraviolet, and with ultraviolet, you know, you get like 12 copies downloaded and five or you know, six account users and uh, multiple devices. And this notion now of, gee, you just sell one copy at a time has, I think, gone, gone, gone by the wayside to a, in an effort to try and accommodate the legitimate interest in consuming the content at, you know, at time points and on devices and in ways that are convenient to the consumer. Also, just to pivot, well, I was going to pivot a little to answer your question, but if you have a follow-up. Well, you I mean, there would be players, huge exposure. I don't think anybody would want to pay 5 or 10 or 25 bucks a month for HBO. I think most people would. It's the paying $130 a month for Comcast that for a lot of us don't want. But I guess what I was kind of saying in a roundabout way is, as the studios are evolving, we find that it used to be like, yes, you literally said to me, <laughs> but, but, but what about the cable? Are, are the cable companies like currently maybe not? Like I mean. Spencer, I honestly feel like it is spread across the ecosystem. I, I referred to that earlier. You can't imagine how difficult the theater owners are in terms of, you know, I mean, you, you go to, I think, move up a video on demand or a premium video on demand to go four or five weeks after, and theaters will threaten to boycott, you know, that they will not show your, your movie. I, I think it's all the way down the line um, that that companies that have very profitable, entrenched business models for distribution are very worried that any modifications or any interlopers along the way will cannibalize them. And so I think I think I don't think it's just the cable and satellite guys. I think. I think it's the theatrical guys. I think it's the broadcast television guys, and I think it's our own, you know, and it's, 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 it's our own companies, because you know we get very nervous ourselves about about you know saying, look, we've got this nice sequence that goes from theatrical to video to pay per view to pay television to basic cable to free over the air broadcast. It's this long you know chain of distribution. Why why the hell would we ever want to disrupt that and potentially trade? The saying used to be analog dollars for digital pennies, you know? So there's, there's, uh, there is res resistance in all corners, in my view. There's one thing I will say about the, the, the sort of conglomerate, the conglomerates that are emerging of both, you know, the pipes and the content owners. Um, you know, we're, we all, everyone reads about the fact that folks are cutting their cord, cords, particularly in younger generations. But the fact of the matter is that cable revenues are cable revenues are up, and the subscriber counts are up, even though people are in fact cutting cable for purposes of television. They actually are now using that same cable provider's pipes for purposes of getting over-the-top content that they were formerly getting from television. So, you know, it's it's it's, it's almost a wash from the cable from the pipe owner's perspective in terms of are they getting the subscribers they've historically had. But the nature of those subscribers is changing as a result of these, these emerging business models that we're seeing, I think. I'd also say just to that point about when you're doing these deals with these, um, like the Olympics or the NBA or um, uh, a conference network or uh, let's say the Pac-12, the third party that's not really in the room, but that's always that, that's being alluded to, but they don't say the name of the third party. It's like the NBA. It's like they won't say Turner, and it's not mentioned anywhere or deal, or the Olympics doesn't say NBC. And we, it's not a, it's not third, there's no third party beneficiary rights in our deal, but it's this unspoken third party or fourth party or fifth party in a room. It's like, it's like when you're trying to ask someone, your, your friend to hang out, and they're like, they don't want to tell you they're checking with their boyfriend before they can make plans with you, right? And so they, they're like, they like, they don't mention that other party, but you're like working in a deal blind in some ways because they won't tell you what the exact arrangement is. And I, I guess I see this even more strongly because since I work so much in the sports and the live space where broadcasters of the value is still, the value proposition is still there and they're getting tons of money from these, they're, they're scared to, to move away from that. And so um, 
that, that power structure, but we do have more content creators that are acting as distributors, like the, the rise of the conference networks. The Pac-12 is their own network. So to the extent that they have their own rights, but they're still selling the rights for lots of stuff to ESPN or to others. So um, it, is this, it is this dance, but it's hard to do a dance when you, all the parties aren't in the room or even being mentioned. And Spencer, some of the things you were talking about remind me of the same arguments that were made by cable operators when satellite distribution was first hitting. Uh, and cable operators got very upset about a program supplier granting rights for satellite distribution, and they wanted a piece of revenues from their territory on the ground that they had helped to promote that programming in the territory, even if there was another distributor around. So it, 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 with every new technology, I think the entrants that have become established in the marketplace uh, uh, often uh, resist new entrants into the marketplace. Uh, there was also a recent survey that concluded that the average number of channels viewed by a typical sub cable subscriber was 17. Uh, and recently, many of the cable operators have been offering um, scaled back, narrower uh, ranges, groups of channels. All, usually without including some of the major sports channels like ESPN, which has the single highest license fee of any basic cable network by far, uh, for subscribers that, that want that because they're concerned about people cutting the cord as well. Well, we've been talking primarily about subscription services like HBO and Showtime and Netflix now. And just for a minute, we wanted to turn to, uh, to sort of free programming and uh, another revenue source that obviously is very important for um, most television networks uh, other than the pay services like HBO and Showtime is advertising, and which is increasingly important for digital distribution services as well. We just wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about uh, new models that have been evolving uh, for advertising as well as for performance metrics for entertainment content as it's being distributed uh, online. And the projections are that online and digital advertising, which really has been explosively accelerating in growth, will uh, surpass expenditures for advertising on tra traditional methods of distribution within a, a year or two. So Stephen, do you have some perspectives on that? I mean, from my perspective, you know, advertising kind of, when you introduce the advertising concept into your deals, it makes things a little bit more complicated, in part because some content owners, as a result of other relationships they have, um, you know, particularly Fox, for instance, with its output deal with HBO, has very strict restrictions about whether or not content that will eventually flow through that HBO relationship can ever actually be available on a service that has advertising at all. <laughs> um, and. And, and so what you're typically finding, I think, nowadays, if you go to, if you go to um, the Xbox video store, you will find basically a tile that takes you into the, VO, the transactional VOD and the EST ser ser uh, section of that service. And you'll find another tile in which you'll find the, basically the free video on demand or, adver or advertising supported video on demand services in that section of the service. Um, and, and what you'll find, obviously, is that you're not going to find any new content, either, either current season television or, 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 or current release feature films in the, in the advertiser support section. And one of the reasons you see that actual, from an, from an architecture perspective, differentiation in these tunnels is as a result of some of the upstream obligations that content owners have taken with respect to advertising supported services through which their content can be made available. Um, separately, though, you, read, you, know, you obviously see services out there that are completely advertiser supported, YouTube, of course, being one, Hulu being another, um, and, 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 and those types of relationships get a little bit tricky from a deal perspective when you try and figure out how you actually are going to define the revenue that's paid to the content owner as a result of the monetization and the, and the distribution of their content on that service. You know, what ads are actually ads that are generating revenue as a result of the content itself as opposed to people just liking the service more broadly. Um, so, you know, I'm finding that there's a lot less activity at the moment, at least on the, on the, on the, current, on the current feature films and television shows on the advertising side than there is, than there is on the SVOD, TVOD, and EST and VOD side. And I might add, on the program production side, I think increasingly you're finding uh, sort of embedded uh, advertising, what's sometimes called product placement, 
that is written into the script and into the production so that if an advertiser pays a certain sum of money, their product uh, or service is featured very prominently in a way that, that can't be stri stripped out by, uh, by commercial sk uh, skipping services. The DVRs have obviously enabled consumers to skip commercials. Also, on the performance metric side, uh, Nielsen now produces ratings not only for people who watch programming in real time, but there's a so-called plus three and a plus seven for three or seven days later, measuring people's viewing on their DVRs. And they've actually found sort of curiously that even when people do watch things uh, on a time-shifted basis, that they often do not fast forward through the commercials. Uh, there's also litigation pending against, uh, I guess, the Hopper, which is marketed by Dish, which automatically skips commercials. Um, Mark, we start about five minutes late. Could, should, can we run a few minutes over, or should we're we? Five minutes late. Yeah, you can end five minutes late. Okay. <laughs> we have about five minutes more. We have a couple of other topics, but before that, we'd just like to see if there's any questions from the audience on anything we've discussed so far. Yes. Yeah, the, the question is, do we have comments on the FCC's net neutrality uh, uh, proceeding? I think it's a very, very tricky area for, 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 for big content owners um, because on the one hand, in terms of our services with our premium content, you know, if we can get really good, reliable delivery to customers, um, that can distinguish that experience from an unauthorized delivery experience, that in some ways is a good thing. On the other hand, the notion that because we have a lot of content that we want to deliver to consumers, that we can be held hostage to, to cable and internet satellite providers who will say, look, unless you pay us for the fast lane, your content's going to look like crap. Um, it's, 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 it's very, very tricky. And um, I, I can say just quite honestly, from the pure Warner Brothers perspective, we have not really figured out our position yet. I mean, it creates a whole new dynamic in the negotiations of these deals. Um, and in a way, it may force um, content owners to figure out a way to actually allow the pipe uh, layers to participate in some of the revenues that are generated by virtue of those pipes. Um, we'll see how it plays out, but I definitely do think it sh shifts deal dynamics significantly. It's obviously a big issue for Google and their people poised within the company, Fred Von Lohman, probably being one of them who could speak better to it at large. But I will say what we're doing at YouTube right now is trying to give the consumer more information. So the Speedy G initiative, um, which may have a uh, um, more professional name by now, but is is to give the consumers a, like almost a transparency report and show them the speeds by which they're getting internet services from their different providers. And to us, that's very important because they got to know where the problem in the pipe is. Like, where is where are things getting stuck? And if consumers don't know that information, which providers are actually say that they're providing it at speeds, but they're having buffering problems truly because of their provider, then how can they how can they get on the right side of the the debate, like how, how can they know how to choose providers? So we're trying to give at least more information as well. Uh, any other questions? I have, I have a question for Marissa on that, actually. So uh, when you guys, because I haven't seen that transparency report, but I have to look for it. When there are problems, is it usually in that last mile to the consumer home, or are there sometimes actually problems up the chain um, in, in terms of, of the network speeds? That's a good question. So, um, so actually, the reason you might not have heard is I think it, it actually was just released last week. Okay. Um, so it's very, very recent. And so I, I don't know that we've yet to see to play out. Our goal was to also be agnostic as to say, here's the different providers, and here's here's what the speeds you're getting, and here's in the regions where you're getting them, and and hope that that either asks has a consumer or the provider. Someone wants to dig in deeper to that issue because they now have the information. Um, and um, and there are there's big discrepancies between providers, but we're hoping that they want to take it on upon themselves, or the industry does, to try and see where that holdup is. 
We have just a couple of minutes left. I'm going to ask an open-ended question and invite the panelists to comment in, in 30 seconds or so if they'd like. We, we were also going to talk about best practices in privacy protection and data collection and ownership. And, and in addition to that, or as part of that, uh, I'm curious as to the perspectives of, of the panelists, uh, if there were sort of one thing that they think is very important to address in terms of best practices on evolving content distribution models, what would it be? So I would invite each of the panelists to, to comment briefly on, on any or all of those topics. We hit is, thank you. It, um, it's a whole new world when you actually have distributors and content creators co-producing, co co-developing content. It's a whole new world from an ownership perspective. Um, you know, the typical studio network deal is that the studio owns the content and they grant, you know, a relatively exclusive license in a particular territory in a particular medium for, to distribute that show. You, you now have a situation in which the networks and the studios, by virtue of their joint contributions to this work, um, are finding themselves as co-owners. And, you know, as a, mo as a matter of copyright law, obviously co-owners have rights um, to exploit the, the copyrights and what they own, subject to a, an accounting and reporting obligation to their co-owner, unless they, unless they basically change that relationship as a result of contract. If, but, it, if it's non-exclusive, if it's exclusive, they, 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 they need the other co-owners. Right, well. right. Um, and so I, I, I think a very interesting thing to think about, and the, and the models are evolving, is you know, from a co-ownership perspective, how do we make sure that we are each getting the benefit of what we expect to have by virtue of the, the, the deal that we're making with our, with our co-developer. Obviously, an online distributor cares a lot about, for instance, Netflix cares about SVOD distribution on the internet in territories in which Netflix has a, has a service. Um, the studio that's co-developing with Netflix might really care about their international television sales because that's a particularly lucrative market for them. Um, you, might, you also have to think about merchandising rights. Who's going to control merchandising rights with respect to content based upon the shows? Who's going to actually register and enforce the copyrights? Who's going to register and enforce the trademarks? How is this all going to be allocated in a way that basically creates one uniform brand and one series to the world in a way that kind of satisfies the you know, sometimes not you know, consistent desires of the two owners as a result of this relationship? Uh, so obviously, I think um, I, I actually look at things mainly from a, like a copyright license, you know, reps and warranties, indemnities, clearances. What are we getting from the partner? And 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 those things, you know, are open to negotiation and and all that kind of thing. But the the things I think the issues that I think are really emerging that we focus on more and that are evolving areas of law are, you know, um, fair use is something that comes up quite often, um, and that's you know, constantly open to interpretation based on case law. I think. Um, the new regulations for the uh, Children Online uh, Protection and Privacy Act and how those new regulations are going to play out with regulations on cookies and, and how more and more content is being geared towards kids. Um, music and the collecting societies and public performance rights, that's always something that's in the background. And then another one is just like content regulations worldwide. So he touched on privacy, which is a big issue in Europe, but another big issue for us in Europe is the audiovisual media directive and, and, and how, how how Europe or Asia deals with certain types of content that is is not is not okay to be shown in Asia. So uh, those are areas where I mean I think we've all gotten comfortable in this space about you know what do you need from a content license, who, exclusivity versus non. What do you want them to clear this and that? But there's all these other areas of law that are in the background that are operating that I think are just comp that are pretty unsettled and 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 so uh, that that's what makes it I think a really interesting space. I mean I agree with everything that. Maurice and Steve j just said, I, I think, you know, and in talking about data and privacy, frankly, that could be an entire day's conference in and of itself. I mean, I think distributors are very interested in data, content owners and creators are interested in data. I think there's a trend towards content creators wanting to have a direct relationship with their consumers to be able to see what they want and get the content to them directly. Um, that's, and, and the some of these new business models really allow for that in a way that was never possible before. But, but to me, the touchstone of what we have to, how, how we have to play it in this new world is to, is to stay flexible and to be willing to take risks and to try, try new things. And that, and that means 
at least in my view, is to try and do deals that give you the flexibility to try new things, and when you try new things, to be able to do them in test runs that won't tie you to a particular platform if it turns out to be a failure. I will, I will give two, two quick examples if I can. We did some film distribution through Facebook, actually, where we were distributing The Dark Knight through Facebook by collection of Facebook points. I don't know what they were, but anyway, what needless, it didn't work. It just didn't work very well. I mean, we didn't, we, didn't, we didn't get much uptake on that. On the other hand, we were frustrated that the Apple, Apple iTunes video store was not rolling out in as many foreign territories as we wanted to see it roll out, as quickly as we wanted to see it roll out. And in certain territories, we were seeing lots and lots of piracy of our feature films. So we developed for our really big tentpole films like Inception or The Dark Knight, we developed our own apps that could be distributed worldwide through the App Store. And with that app, it was like a freemium sort of offer. The app was for free. You got teaser and some interesting background content in 30, I think it was like 27 or 30 languages that you could do subtitling and even some of the dubbing. And then if you were interested, you could buy the content. And so, and that ended up being quite, quite successful for us. And actually Apple, you know, maybe not, there may not have been a direct causal relationship, but Apple ended up uh, rolling out its, its video stores to a lot more countries uh, uh, sooner after that. So there's got, in my view, there's got to be this willingness to experiment and take risks. Okay, we are out of time. Please take a minute to fill out the online evaluations. They're very, very helpful to Stanford. And please join me in thanking Marisa, Stephen, and Dean for a terrific panel. <laughs>